Good evening and uh, welcome to our Holocaust Memorial here in uh, Evangelical Free Church in Helsinki, Andreas Chökan, uh, where we will remember and honor the uh, six million Jews who died in the uh, Shoah. Not all those who died and perished were Jews, but all Jews were victims. But there were also those who survived. We have just uh, seen the uh, story from Giselle Sukovic, who shared her testimony with uh, videographer Perry Trotter, uh, who is now joining us from uh, uh, Auckland, New Zealand, together with his wife. Uh, good morning, Perry and Shira Trotter. Uh, why is it important that we remember the testimonies of uh, uh, those who survived the Shoah? Good morning, Thomas. Uh, Anti-Semitism is alive and well. It, it's unfortunately considered by many that the Holocaust was really just a, a quirk of history as though the Jews were in the wrong place at the wrong time, but that's certainly not the case. Uh, Anti-Semitism has a very significant context, uh, a, a massive history, and it continues even to the present time, and the memory is under attack. So it is important that we hear these testimonies of Holocaust survivors today so that we can keep the memory alive. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yes, and um, Holocaust memory uh, is, is under threat in a number of ways. And, and one of these ways, of course, is distortion of the Holocaust, uh, where some nations now are rewriting the story so that it minimizes their own invol uh, involvement in the Holocaust, or um, they might be honoring uh, their national heroes who were act actually perpetrators during the Holocaust. So we need to hear the stories of the survivors to remind us of, um, of the reality of the Holocaust. And I think when we hear their personal stories, uh, it helps us to identify with them as people. It helps to humanize the story. Um, so often we can get uh, overwhelmed by data, by statistics. And so it's important to hear that human voice and also to know that they, they had a history before and after the Holocaust. They weren't just um, victims of the Holocaust. Um, so these things are really important. And um, I would say that one other um, threat to the Holocaust is, is appropriation. We're seeing often now that people will take the Holocaust for their own political uses. And in that way, um, the Holocaust also gets distorted. So these things are, are, are all reasons why we, we need to um, hear the stories, the testimonies of the survivors. We are today talking of things of the past. Uh, is Jew hatred still a problem today? Absolutely. One of the remarkable things about anti-Semitism is its uh, ability to adapt. It adapts across cultures, across ages. It takes on different forms, uh, depending on the people group and the culture of the time. And Sheree will say more about these sorts of things. But today, anti-Zionism, uh, hatred of the Jewish state, is the probably the weapon of choice amongst anti-Semites of all sorts of people groups from the far left to the right. Uh, religious anti-Zionism. Uh, so it's very much a matter uh, that's pressing today. Yes, and, I, and we know that in Europe, anti-Semitism is rising and it's a great concern, but even in far away New Zealand, we see anti-Semitism rising. And of course, social media is a big part of this. It gives a platform for anti-Semites to spread their um, toxic ideas. And we see it even in New Zealand uh, with the coronavirus. There was a proliferation of conspiracy theories that arose. And uh, last year, we had an election and one of the political parties even drew on um, Jewish conspiracy theories and, and were promoting really bad ideas. So this is something that, as Rabbi Sachs has said, it seems to change the, the way it um, manifests change changes, but that underlying anti-Semitism remains. And so we need to keep vigilant. Uh, and in fact, in New Zealand yesterday, uh, we uh, commemorated the UN um, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And there was an op-ed in the paper by the Human Rights Commissioner and the Race Relations Commissioner expressing their concern about anti-Semitism in New Zealand and giving examples of the, the sort of anti-Semitic tropes that are becoming uh, more common now. 
So this is something that we need to really keep on top of. Very briefly, what is the best way to commemorate the victims of the uh, Holocaust? Well, in terms of commemoration, one uh, method that I'd like to recommend is we've recently, we of the Holocaust Foundation have recently uh, released an app and it contains many of our three minute stories and many resources dealing with distortion of the Holocaust universalization. Uh, something else that can be done, which I think you will probably address later in this program, is adoption of the IRA definition. And that I'm particularly keen on that definition because it addresses the fact that anti-Zionism is very much the common form of anti-Semitism today. Thank you to both of you. And I realize only now that in New Zealand, it's a new day, it's the 28th. Whereas here in Europe, we are still uh, commemorating the 27th of January, the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Thank you so much, Barry and Shiri. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be a different uh, memorial ceremony from previous years in that we will have Christian leaders from around the world who have sent uh, recorded messages to us in uh, support for our message here today. We are honored to have seven such messages in our program tonight, as well as keynote speakers, uh, Gregory Lafitte and Katharina von Schnurbein. The musical interludes are provided by Kolorbach Ensemble, which also joined us in the synagogue in Krakow in uh, six years ago for the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, they have just released uh, a brand new album and all the musical pieces are from this album. The memorial is hosted by the European and the International Coalition for Israel and my name is Thomas Sandel. Let us now hear from Gordon Robertson, president of CBN, Virginia Beach in the United States, Pastor Yang Tuk Yong from the Cornerstone Church in Singapore, and uh, Reverend Nikki Gamble from Holy Trinity Brompton in London. Hello, this is Gordon Robertson, president of the Christian Broadcasting Network. Greetings from the United States. Today, we remember the terrible events of the Holocaust, the systematic and state-sponsored killing of more than six million Jewish men, women, and children. Though there were many horrors and tragedies during World War II, nothing compares to the evil and inhumanity of Nazi death camps. Today, we remember the victims who were robbed not only of their lives, their homes, businesses, and possessions, but of their very humanity. The toxic poison of anti-Semitism, as with all forms of hatred, are an outright assault on the humanity of people created in God's image. 76 years later, we continue to firmly declare never again. And yet we are living in a time where we're seeing another rising tide of anti-Semitism in the world today. We've seen attacks on Jewish lives, Jewish communities, synagogues, as well as Nazi swastikas vandalizing Jewish holy sites and gravestones. The world's only Jewish nation is singled out for condemnation, boycott, divestment, sanctions, while her people face the constant threat of war and terror along their borders. Today, as we remember the Holocaust, may we renew our commitment to stand against all forms of anti-Semitism in our world. Together, you and I can combat the lies, the hatred, and the misinformation with the truth. Each of us can use our platforms of influence to help change the global conversation about the Jewish people and especially about Israel. On this solemn day, we at the Christian Broadcasting Network remember, and we join you in declaring never again. May God bless you.
I'm deeply honored to be asked to say a few words on this Holocaust Memorial Day. I'm Pastor Young from Singapore, and you know Singapore is one of the few countries in the world where the Jewish community is not just tolerated, but celebrated. Singapore and Israel, we share a wonderful history of friendship, and I pray that it will continue to be so. On this day, we remember the massacre of six million Jews in what was probably the bleakest hour in human history. And right around us, we are seeing the world being divided. It's probably the most divided time in history of mankind, brother against brother. And this spirit of anti-Semitism is rising up in many nations. And the church has a responsibility to speak up against this evil. We must never allow anti-Semitism to rear its ugly head again. The church has a responsibility to voice and to stand strongly with the Jewish community. It was the German theologian Martin Niemöller who said those haunting words. When they came for the communists, he said, I did not speak up because I was not a communist. Then they came for the Jew, and I did not speak up because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and that I did not speak up because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak up for me. Very haunting words. You know, my friends, not to speak up is to speak up. Not to act in the face of evil is to act itself. And so today on this Holocaust Memorial Day, I appeal to my Christian brothers and sisters globally, let's stand with Israel, let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem, let's pray for the peace of Israel, and we speak the shalom of God over all the communities around the world. May the Lord God Almighty bless you and keep you in His peace. Hi, my name's Nicky Gumbel, and my father came to this country, to Britain, as a refugee from the Nazis. Some of his family escaped, but many of them perished in the Holocaust. They were murdered in concentration camps. And it's so important, I believe, to take a stand against anti-Semitism in all its forms. And not to forget our history, not to forget the past, but to learn the lessons and to ensure that what happened in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany is never repeated. So to all those today who remember the Holocaust and to take a stand against anti-Semitism, we salute you. Thank you, brothers, for your heartfelt uh, message from three different continents. We will now hear from ECI Director for UN Affairs, Dr. Gregory Lafitte, who will speak to us live from Basel, Switzerland. His message will be followed by a statement from former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Carey. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Anti-Semitism has taken many shapes and forms during the centuries. It is called the world's oldest hatred because it certainly is. As we witness the current resurgence of discord 
a number of questions arise. We ask with Emil Zola, why the Jews? How does anti-Semitism appear? In what context? For what reason? It is not enough to stand up against anti-Semitism and to say no to Jew hatred. We must understand its inner workings, its machinery. We must find its blueprint. I've expressed before what I believe is very important, that is, that there is a fundamental difference between antisemitism and racism. Racism is the exacerbation of a feeling of superiority towards someone who has not the same ethnicity, origins, language, accent, culture, religion, etc. Antisemitism finds refuge in the shadow of a discourse, a thinking which is in a way the antithesis of racism. This discourse goes by asking such questions such as, how is it that Jews have something that I have not? How is it that Jews have are what I am not? It's important to note that the Jews have done the complete opposite of the reproaches of the questions asked by the anti-Semit. Instead of keeping for themselves their own culture, their own treasure, they shared it with the rest of us. They gave it to us, and it has in many ways become part of our own national identities and cultures. But even at a more global level, it has become part of our common culture. This clearly indicates that we must fight anti-Semitism in, in, a, in a distinctive way. We cannot just fight all racisms together and hope that anti-Semitism will be dealt with. It doesn't work. But while important, these considerations do not offer answers to our questions. They do not give us a glimpse of the blueprint, blueprint of anti-Semitism. To understand how anti-Semitism appears works, one must go back to the time of Jesus, to the first century, to Publius Cornelius Tacitus. Tacitus, one of the most famous and admired historians of all times, wrote, to establish his influence over this people for all time, Moses introduced new religious practices, quite opposed to those of all other religions. The Jews regard as profane all that we hold sacred. On the other hand, they permit all that we abhor. The words apudnos in Latin, we in this English translation, indicate all of humanity. The words, all that we hold sacred, designate the sum of all the beliefs common to all men, as they are universal and immemorial. These beliefs are varied, sometimes in contradiction to one another, but they have a common understanding when it comes to separate the sacred from the abhorrent. The Jews differ dramatically. Following Moses, the Jews are on the other side, on every essential aspect. Jean-Claude Milner summarizes this as saying that by their rights and their customs, the Jews make it impossible to consider all of humanity in a consistent way. They render impossible the use of the for all quantifier when speaking of all human beings. Jean-Paul Sartre had also understood that when he wrote the authentic Jew abandons the myth of a universal man. To summarize, the Jews hinder all of humanity from coming together and becoming almost one. Every universal project, as soon as it does not consider its cracks, its constitutive exceptions, is threatened by the totalitarian temptation, which, to save it all, will always put the Jews in a position of exception. Jew hatred always builds itself as a dream of all, a dream of universality, which requires of the Jew to be in this position of exception. We have to go back in time even more if we also want to consider the biblical roots, the spiritual roots of anti-Semitism. It's again a story where Jews are put in this position of exception. The story of Mordechai, of his niece Esther, and of the intrigues of the Persian court revolves around the anti-Semitic scheming of Haman 
the Agagai. There is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all, all other people and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. From where does Amman's anti-Semitism come? It is rooted in a history of jealousy, deception, and hatred that stretches back, as does Amman's genealogy, through Amalek, Timna, and Esau, to the murder of one brother by another, Abel, at the hands of Cain. The story of Abel and Cain seems to constitute one of the deepest roots of anti-Semitism, as best expressed by the following words. There is a debate on who is really the author of these words. It was first said that they were a prayer formulated by Pope John XXIII, I don't know. But these words gave, in my opinion, one of the best answers to this deep root of anti-Semitism. Today, we realize that for many centuries, our eyes were blinded and that we can no longer see the beauty of your people, that they are chosen, that we recognize on their face the features of our privileged brothers. We realize that the sign of Cain is engraved on our foreheads. For centuries, our brother Abel lay in the blood and tears that we caused him to shed, for we had forgotten your love. Forgive us for having wrongly attached a curse to their name as Jews. Forgive us for having once again crucified you in their flesh, for we knew not what we were doing. As we start this journey with the Christian communities worldwide, we would like to invite our Christian brothers to make this prayer theirs, to stand by the Jewish people, to proclaim bold and clear to the world the following declaration, which transforms the terrifying question of Cain to a resounding rallying call. I am my brother's keeper. Please allow me to end with the following traditional prayer. It is called El Malay Achamim, God full of mercy, God full of mercy, defender of widows and father of orphans, be not silent or restrained regarding the blood which was spilt like water. Grant proper rest beneath the wings of your presence in the great heights of the holy and pure, who like the brilliance of the heavens give light and shine. For the souls of multitudes of thousands of Israel, men, women, and children, who were killed and slaughtered and suffocated and burnt and buried alive in the hands touched by the hand of the German oppressor and his followers. All of them holy and pure. May the Garden of Eden be their resting place. Therefore, may the Master of Mercy shelter them in the shelter of his wings for eternity and bind their souls with the bond of life. God is their inheritance and may they find peaceful repose in their resting place. And let us say, amen. Hello, I'm Lord Carey, former Archbishop of Canterbury. I was nearly 10 in 1945 when, as a London boy, I was told about the liberation of the Bergen Belsen concentration camp by the British Army. Although many people were saved, thousands of bodies lay unburied around the camp, and some 60,000 starving and mortally ill people were packed together without food, water, and sanitation. That dreadful information has scarred my memory for life. It's made me a keen supporter of Holocaust education. For the sake of those millions of people who died so barbarically, we must hallow their memory. You know, if we forget, it could so easily happen again.
Thank you. It's a special honor for us to have the EU coordinator for the combat against anti-Semitism and fostering of Jewish life, Katharina von Schnubein, give us a message from the European Commission in Brussels. She will be followed by the Evangelical Lutheran Bishop of Helsinki, Teemu Laiosalo, and Dr. Arto Hamelainen, Chairman of the Pentecostal Commission on Religious Liberty. Dear friends at the European Coalition for Israel, today at the occasion of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, it is an honor to share a few thoughts with you. It is and remains our sacred duty to remember the victims of the Shoah. We will not forget them and we will always remember that it was anti-Semitism that led to the Holocaust. As we see Jew hatred and anti-Semitic conspiracy myths on the rise again today, one thing is certain. This time, Europe is on the side of its Jewish community. I'm particularly worried about the rise of Holocaust distortion. Outright Holocaust denial is unacceptable in most parts of society, but distorting the Holocaust by making false comparisons by accusing the Jews or Israel of capitalizing on the Holocaust, or by suggesting that Jews brought the Shoah upon themselves, are much more common and deeply rooted allegations. Holocaust trivialization and distortion are dangerous, as we have seen in the attack on the synagogue in Halle, Germany in 2019, and the many other lethal attacks across Europe. Theodor Adorno once said, anti-Semitism is the rumor about Jews. In parallel with the pandemic, we've seen that these rumors are on the rise again. Online, the idea that Jews are behind the virus spread quickly. On demonstrations in the streets of European capitals, we saw anti-vaxxers wearing yellow stars that said unvaccinated and some declared publicly, I feel like Anne Frank, and others stood by and said nothing. Don't get me wrong, opposition to government measures is part of democracy and not all those demonstrating harvest anti-Semitic prejudices. But when we see others making false comparisons with the Holocaust or accusing Jews, we must speak up. It was Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel who said, what hurts the victim most is not the cruelty of the oppressor, but the silence of the bystander. In the face of rising antisemitism, let's not be bystanders, not online and not offline. To address online Holocaust distortion, the European Commission together with the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, short IRA, the UN and UNESCO launched yesterday a campaign on social media called Protect the Facts to address the form of anti-Semitism that is called Holocaust distortion. And I encourage you all to participate and to spread the word. I welcome the active engagement of the European Coalition for Israel in addressing anti-Semitism and thank you for the close cooperation over the years. Your call to churches to adopt and implement the IRA definition of anti-Semitism is very welcome. For the European Commission, it has been clear for some years that you can't fight it if you can't define it. And so we have been using the IRA working definition almost since it was adopted some five years ago. As Christians, standing with the Jewish community is our responsibility. It goes hand in hand with not being bystander, with speaking up when we see Jew hatred. The IRA definition helps to recognize all forms, including Israel-related antisemitism. And I hope that many churches, Christian communities and organizations will join the ECI's initiative and use the IRA definition. 
To support civil society in their initiatives against Jew hatred, the European Commission, together with the IRA, issued a handbook some three weeks ago for the practical use of the IRA definition. I've sent the link to Thomas Sandel for distribution among the members of ECI. Dear friends, the Shoah did not start in the gas chambers of Auschwitz, nor did anti-Semitism vanish when the evacuation of the Nazi death camps took place. Uprooting it requires sustained and renewed efforts. The European Commission will therefore adopt this year a comprehensive and ambitious strategy on combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life. Europe is determined to win this fight and to ensure that Jews see a future for themselves in Europe. Thank you very much. Dear friends, last year the Bishops' Conference of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland made what I regard as a significant statement in a document about interreligious encounter. The statement includes the following. Antisemitism has a varied history. Hatred of Jews may be right-wing or left-wing, Islamic or Christian. The churches must resist all antisemitism as defined by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. The State of Israel must be judged by the same criteria as other democracies. Sometimes, however, criticism of Israel includes veiled antisemitism. Debate concerning antisemitism's various manifestations should be ongoing. I am very pleased that the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland is renouncing antisemitism in all its forms so clearly. I also urge all other denominations to do the same. Now I wish the blessing of God to you all. Ladies and gentlemen, we must not forget. I cannot forget what I saw in Auschwitz when I visited the concentration camp museum in 1977 for the first time. Till today, I cannot forget the stacks of toys that had been taken from the children as they entered the dead factory. At that time, my own daughters were six and two years old. How many loved children like them arrived in Auschwitz to their fatal destination, to be killed by gas and to be burned in an oven? My daughters had beautiful blonde hair, sometimes plaited into long braids. What a huge mound of hair I saw that was still left there in Auschwitz. Everything of value was stolen by the servants of the anti-Semitic machinery. Jewels, shoes, cold feet. People were reduced to raw material. This happened not only in Auschwitz, but I have witnessed similar scenes in Mauthausen, Austria, in Belgium, and saw a summary of those cruelties in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. This anti-Semitic maltreatment has been documented in books and movies. It has been translated into music in the 13th symphony of Sostakovich, which is a denunciation of the massacre of Jews at Babi Yar. Anti-Semitism degrades the value of the human being. If we see the value of an individual person through the lens of creation, 
people were made in the image of God, so every one of them is of immeasurable value. We will now ask our chairman, Tor Ge Gul, to light six candles in the memories of the six million Jews who were murdered in the Shoah, followed by a brief prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, today we remember, we remember the dark days of the Holocaust. We remember the six million Jews that were brutally murdered just because they were Jewish. We remember. When we repeat what so many people, politicians, governments, and others declared after World, World War II, never 
again. Dear Lord, despite the declaration never again, the ugly face of anti-Semitism is showing up again in various parts of the world. We pray for the Jewish community in this country, Finland. We pray for the Jewish communities in other European countries. We pray for the Jewish communities worldwide. Bless them, protect them from anti-Semitism and other evil things. Father, we thank you that today the Jews have a homeland, Israel. We pray for Israel. We ask for your blessings and protection over the country and all its people. In your holy name, amen. Thank you, Tor Gull. Our memorial is shortly coming to a close. Let me thank each one of you who have participated. But remember, it doesn't stop here. It was anti-Semitism that led to the Holocaust and the same Jew hatred is on the rise today. Earlier tonight, we heard a quote from Holocaust survivor and Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel, who said, what hurts the victims the most is not the cruelty of the oppressor, but the silence of the bystander. We can no longer be bystanders. This is the time for churches and faith communities around the world to say loud and clear, in times of rising anti-Semitism, we will not remain silent. This time we will speak up and be on the side of our Jewish communities. Therefore, tonight we issue a call to churches and Christian organizations around the world to adopt the IRA working definition on anti-Semitism and by doing so, taking a stand against the rise of Jew hatred today. Our last speaker will be Björn Uwe Aronson from the Free Evangelical Church in Geneva. Please join us again on Sunday at 16 hours Brussels time when we will have a webinar on the theme of Christian response to the rise of anti-Semitism. From us here in Andreas Cherkan in Helsinki, we say thank you and good night. Remembering is a prerequisite for healing of relations. And the work of remembrance goes hand in hand with truth. They need each other. With this backdrop, the historic attempt to exterminate the Jewish people, the Shoah, must never be forgotten. Together with many other leaders, as the church leader of the Free Evangelical Church of Geneva, I hereby pledge to endorse the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of antisemitism, to annually commemorate Holocaust Remembrance Sunday, to raise awareness and actively teach about the scourge of antisemitism. Join us. <laughs>